welcome to Live Your Own Way with me, Lucy Gleason Interiors, chatting homes, life and inspiration with my very special guests. My guest today is the wonderful William Hardy, Amazing Spaces presenter and Shed of the Year judge with George Clark. William is founder and main director of Studio Hardy, which is a design and manufacturing studio that fuses art, engineering, architecture and craft. They've worked on some really incredible projects, all diverse, such as playgrounds, interior design, exhibition spaces, architecture, grand tree houses and repurposing vehicles into something extraordinary, using innovative design with a mixture of technology and traditional techniques and also using a plethora of materials. Hello, William. Um, I really appreciate you popping by today. How's your day been? It's been really good. I started the day um, going sledging on the downs. Amazing. <laughs> um, I promised the boys that we'd go out, so um, we dashed up there. There wasn't much snow, but um, we had a, had a laugh. Have you been working today? Is your studio close to uh, where you live? Yeah, it's about sort of 25 minutes walk, and um, I've been in the workshop all day, and it's... Um, kind of organized chaos we've got two projects both on the go and at sort of five o'clock tomorrow morning a crane and five arctics arrive uh to pick up one project and then um that makes space for the second project to kind of spread out so it's been a very very busy day sort of prepping for tomorrow but also um getting our heads around the next phase of, of a really interesting project we're working on. Is it generally like that with work? Do you always have new things happening every week? It's, yeah, it is. It's, sort of, it's just a series of challenges. So, um, yeah, we work on very, very diverse projects. And within each project, there's sort of a myriad of different problems to solve and ideas to have. So it's incredibly varied. Yeah. So that aside, how, how are you getting on with the homeschooling as well? Because obviously that's a big thing at the moment. <laughs> um, it's pretty tough at the moment. Um, uh, we're sort of homeschooling. I've got an eight year old and a 10 year old um, and then a really busy workshop. So luckily we, we, we're actually as busy as we've ever been at work but trying to juggle that and then most of my team you know we put family first uh, at Studio Hardy um, so that means that everybody's schedule is completely bonkers you know people need to do different batches of homeschooling or walking the dog or whatever they need to do and we're sort of then trying to work together as a team but we're we're muddling through. Oh, that's good. And do, do the boys ever come in and help you out? Yeah, they do, actually. I mean, the last sort of pocket money job was sorting the samples cupboard, which was quite good, trying to allot different materials and different textures. Um, but we also come in, you know, and actually at lockdown, it's brilliant because they get fed up of being home and going on endless walks so that we can come into the workshop and just sort of beaver away. Um, I think last weekend they made a a velociraptor pen for some dinosaurs and a kind of toy x-wing star wars fighter so uh we get up to all sorts of um you know mischief over the weekend here oh that sounds fantastic so speaking of um building and learning where did your journey start well as a kid i always made things um i i you know started with little um sort of plastic kit models and then got more and more interested in making the sort of scenery around them And then at school, I studied, I was very lucky, I managed to study art, design and theatre set building. Um, So always a very sort of hands on approach. And then um, sort of, I also, from quite a young age, would just get jobs, um, either gardening or building things or putting up shelves or, you know, someone would say, oh, I really need a bookcase. And I'd say, I'll make you that and then work out how to do it. And then I moved on to go to art college. So I did a foundation course, which was brilliant, a sort of really varied experience of sculpture and fine art and graphic design and photography and, again, theatre. And that led on to me doing a um, part of a degree. I never finished it um, at Brighton University, which was called Wood, Metal, Ceramics and Plastics, sort of craft-based design and making course. Um, And though I really enjoyed that, at the same time, I got very interested in permaculture and ecology and worked with some other people, sort of was involved in the founding of a a charity 
And so I actually quit college, uh, quit university to to sort of pursue that. Um, and then that led me on to, there was a really interesting community project. We were trying to sort of buy land and save it for, for public use and for, for the expansion of, of um, permaculture. And that, what I learned was working with a lot of uh, groups of people. And that led me on to realizing I needed to know more about how to work with people. So I went to California and studied spiritual psychology for a couple of years. <laughs> um, and then that, I gradually got back into the craft world. I sort of been using my brain rather a lot, uh, sort of more sort of political and um, psychological pursuits. And um, I became an apprentice to a sculptor, a green woodworking sculptor called Alison Crowther, who taught me how to carve and chainsaw and a lot of those sort of um, how to work with green wood. And from there, I went on and started becoming a timber frame builder and work with some brilliant timber framers. So that's, you know, your classic medieval barns. And that was my sort of introduction to engineering and more about timber, more about history. And that eventually I got slightly tired of, of sort of building medieval buildings. And at that point, I kind of fused all the diverse parts of my journey from art school and design to all the craft work, to even the permaculture in terms of philosophy and the psychology, and founded um, Studio Hardy. Right. So all of those things together have been really useful to where you are now. Absolutely. I mean, you know, when I'm talking to to kids or or lecturing at university, I'm a real great believer that whatever you study, whatever you do, somehow feeds in, and you can't always see how it does. But absolutely everything you ever do um, is a component in your sort of life's work. Yeah. The inter- the, um, interested in the spiritual psychology. Uh, I didn't know there was yeah. such a thing. <laughs> it's, it's quite a rarity, yeah. But it's um, a, basically a way, of, um, a way of dealing with emotions. You know, as, as human beings, we, we're trying to get on with whatever we're getting on with. And we're constantly sort of bashed around by emotions. We either react to them or, or um, run away from them. And that sort of dictates and, and carves out our lives. So it's a way of sort of becoming aware of that and so becoming free of that. Um, and it is really useful for working with other people, you know, really, really being able to hear what the problem is beneath the symptoms. Um, and, and, you know, now working with a big team, uh, that's that's really useful and I think as much as the projects and everything we do is interesting actually you know just how you work as a team and how you form a company and how you work with your clients and so on um, is is equally interesting yeah it's really it's imperative really isn't it so what was your big break then Um, before you started Studio Hardy you were still a studio weren't you but you were called something different yeah it was called William Hardy Design and the the really big break was um, it was kind of a you know from naught to sixty in a couple of seconds. Um, I got invited to design and build the King and Queen of Jordan's playground for their new palace in Amman. Wow! <laughs> so yeah, no, it was, that was exactly my response when I got the job. So I worked with um, a real mentor and sort of patron of mine, I suppose, um, Arnie Maynard, the the garden designer, who um, gave me an incredible break and and took a huge risk on me, you know, because I'd done lots of things, but nothing of that scale. And um, the Royal Hashemite Court of Jordan was was building a new palace for for the king and queen. And Arnie was doing the garden design. And the Queen had expressed an interest in having some sort of play structures for the children. Uh, and that's why I was brought in. And that was my first sort of um, playground experience. But I sort of fused all of those diff- different parts of my life, you know, from, from um, sort of timber framing and all the craft and timber work through to the design and, and um, all my design and sort of sculptural work. They're very, it was a very sort of sculptural playground. And you've built um, several playgrounds, haven't you? There was a really lovely one that you built in Battle Abbey. That's right. Yeah, yeah. So we, um, I mean, playgrounds are sort of the the mainstay of uh, our work. Um, 
I think playfulness is very much a thread that works through everything at Studio Hardy. But um, after after working in Jordan, we developed a really good uh, relationship with English Heritage. And um, again, that sort of background of timber framing and working on historic buildings. Um, so we, we, we've built sort of Baroque and 17th century. We've built Art Deco playgrounds, um, all sorts. <laughs> Um, but I really love that, the fact that we're, we're going to very uh, sensitive historic sites and we need to come up with something that's really appropriate, that's to a degree educational and fun. Um, so it's a constant challenge and a constant having to learn about the history and about all the stories and the, the narratives that we can um, follow in our play and sort of introduce the children to the, to the world they're stepping into. Yeah. And again, again, it, it brings up, you know, learning about people, doesn't it? So, yeah. So you do diverse projects. How would you actually sum up what you do? That is really tricky. That's a, that's a life work, <laughs> trying to work it out. <laughs> um, I mean, the way I normally describe what we do is, is, is through Studio Hardy. So Studio Hardy, and you'll see the link here, was founded on the idea that I don't really believe in boundaries between disciplines. So we wanted to form a house that could look at engineering, sculpture, art, design, craft, thinking, philosophy, um, concepts, and do all of those things in one place uh, as one team. So if you look at the world and where it's sort of very much broken up and if you, you know, you know, my early experience of working on, say, building sites where architects didn't talk to engineers and engineers didn't talk to builders and nobody talked to craftspeople and, you know, it's really fragmented. And I thought, actually, there's so much brilliant knowledge. There's so many experts. Um, c- can we develop a practice that really listens and actually collaborates, you know, really deep collaboration so we all learn and, and sort of play together. Um, How did you all find each other? Um, sort of really quite randomly, actually, how, how people come along. I think, I think there's, there's something about the workshop and the work we do that, you know, we do attract kind of outlaws, um, <laughs> um, people that don't quite fit uh, anywhere else. Um, and I, I think, you know, that, that's a... I don't know how everybody would feel about me saying this, but we're, you know, because we're trying to do things differently, we attract people that maybe don't fit in conventional ways of doing things. I love those kind of people. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I've got to say, carpenters are naturally outlaws. They're always, you know, they they don't really want to be part of the system. They want to do things in their own way, and uh, we've sort of created a home for all these um, waifs and strafes. So how do you coordinate when you're doing various projects? How do you coordinate all of you working on different things at different times? Coordination is really tricky. And uh, I suppose another part of Studio Hardy is we, we started not knowing the answer and we're incredibly experimental. So we we try different systems and different ways of doing things and we kind of play musical chairs with our roles Um in a sort of search that, that somewhere out there is a perfect way of working. And um, through that, we, are, we evolve. Um, every project is different. So right now, we're trying a completely different experiment, which is, you know, rather than the sort of design team in cons- consultation with the, with the workshop team, you know, uh, coming to plans and then taking those plans to the workshop to build, what we're doing is so complicated that we've decided let's let's arm all the carpenters with computers. So right now there's sort of three or four com- um, carpenters out there with computers and the designers also out there. They're sort of simultaneously designing and reading the drawings and making, um, <laughs> which uh, is just, it's project specific. So I, I suppose that's that's how we work. It's looking at because every project's so different, we need to build a system, sort of start from scratch each time and go, you know, what, what's worked in the past and how should we approach this specific project and, and should we try something new? And you all obviously specialise in something different. That's right, yeah. So everything from, you know, well, over the years, we've worked from shipwrights to wheelwrights to um, fabricators to blacksmiths. I mean, our, 
our speciality is really about uh, timber and timber engineering. So, so in the workshop, we've got kitchen makers and um, uh, cabinet makers, as well as uh, specialists like timber framers and so on. And what excites you the most about the process and which, which part of it do you love the most? I mean, the real joy for me is, is the conceptual phase, is where you're given um, a brief of some sort. You know, the first stage might be really trying to understand that brief and almost rewrite it for the clients. But just that open blank piece of paper and the way I work is I, I, I think about the project and then I, I allow myself and the rest of the team to just, just go wild, just however sort of far we want to travel, we allow that to happen. So the way I work is I fill, you know, pages and pages and pages um, with drawings and I just sort of let myself go. And then um, once I've done that enough, I then start to rein it in. I look at all, all the wonderful ideas and connections and brainstorming we've done and start to find sort of patterns in that um, and then ho- hone in and sort of hone them down into a, eventually a final design. But it's that, it's that genuinely not knowing what the answer is. And you always get that tiny bit of fear of like, what, what if it suddenly doesn't work? What if for the first time we can't come up with a solution um and there's often a few moments in the process where you are sort of panicked and and it's not quite working but sooner or later that revelation comes and it all just suddenly fits into place well that's what i was going to ask you actually is there ever um a project or a situation where you think i don't know if i'm going to be able to you know find a solution or do you always find one there's always a moment in that sort of process where you have the dark night of the soul <laughs> and you're banging your head against a brick wall and um experience has told me that there is always a solution and it is it is like a revelation um where you just suddenly something clicks and you go ah oh, eureka but it i have a sort of interesting process which is a mix of of art and science so that the, the science part is breaking it down into processes sort of you know almost what I learned at school aims apparatus method so you have that as your toolbox and then the art side is the sort of freedom and the sort of dancing around and exploring random um side tracks and that sort of thing and somehow through that that um you know I never sit around waiting for inspiration I work hard at it and and sooner or later it comes I mean the, the project that we're all scratching our head on at the moment is is part of a playground and um, it's for a heritage project, but we really couldn't find a link with the heritage that really worked. Um, but I was running lots of community workshops with children where I was training them up to be play designers and tra- training them, you know, actually sort of not dumbing down the process at all, really taking them through the whole concept and design development and materials and the whole works. And I suddenly I suddenly looked at all the scrumpled paper that they, um, whenever they did a design they didn't like, they'd scrumple up their page and throw it on the floor. And I looked at the structures or, or the, these amazing forms of scrumpled paper and got them to start playing with them. And, and the final piece we're working on is basically a giant sort of blown up piece of scrumple paper. So that, that's an example of a project where, you know, the day before that moment happened, we were really stuck. We really couldn't work out what the sort of centrepiece of this playground was going to be. That's, that's amazing. It's just like a flick of a switch and then yeah. completely changes it around. Yeah. yeah. You've done so many cool collaborations. I was looking through them all and... Um, I think it might have been one of your earlier ones with a house within a house um, at the Design Museum. Yeah. Did you enjoy that one? I'm sure you must have done. That was great. So that was for John Pawson, who's the sort of, you know, godfather of minimalism, British minimalism. And he wanted to create a perfect one-to-one scale, a one-to-one scale model of a perfect room. And obviously working with somebody that is, you know, st- such a stickler for perfection was quite quite scary. But what was really cool about that project was we went to the Design Museum and it was actually the second project we'd done with the Design Museum. And 
the first one was with Hussein Chalian, the, the fashion designer. And we'd realized that basically every time they, they're a very brave design museum, they'll put on a proper show. They'll, they'll kind of rebuild the whole of the, of the exhibition floor. Um, but at the end of each exhibition, they'd throw everything in the skip and then start again. And so we were, as well as wanting to build this thing for John Pawson and, and try and make it flawless, um, get, which was a real challenge because we only had about five or, or maximum sort of eight days to install this perfect room. We also wanted to sort of have zero waste. So we designed a system that could be reused um, for the design museum. And years later, we returned and they were still using um, components that we we built in that exhibition. Wow, that's that's brilliant. Amazing. And the uh, timber frame farmhouse as well in Scotland. How, how did that work? Because obviously it's really far away from where you live. Gosh, yeah, we do like a challenge. So the, the timber frame um, farmhouse... Oh, gosh, the, I think one of the real the real thing with that project was the logistics of getting it there. There's one ferry that has to be booked sort of months in advance. And I think we had to, you know, even the uh, we needed a telehandler, sort of a, you know, a mobile forklift. And even that had to be put on the boat to take over there. Um, so that was just I mean, we really like an adventure, basically. So um, one thing to get things right and to um, not spend spend too long away from our families we 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 like to prefabricate all projects and obviously some of that comes from the timber frame um you know in that timber frames can be built in a workshop or in a yard and then transported and sort of put together like a giant um medieval meccano set so um we sit we do really like projects that can be built here got just right and then and then a sort of wonderful trip of going somewhere um far away to put it up yeah speaking of which as well the, i was really interested in the vivo v wagon because it, it yeah. mentions a mountain cleaning what what was that all about well vivo a really interesting company is sort of um they're they're really really passionate so so what one of the, one of the things that's a real sort of checkpoint for us is finding people that we really get on with um and we met the Vivo team. They were so passionate about the sort of whole barefoot philosophy, but also ecology and sustainability. And rather than having lots of shops, they wanted a sort of outreach vehicle that could not, not be a sort of hard sell of, of selling shoes, but could go out and sort of spread the message of ecology. So whether that was beach cleanups or going up to the mountains and so they needed a, a, a mobile wagon that they could take anywhere, invite people in, um, take to festivals, do sort of yoga workshops, teach, go and um, be a sort of hub for all of these outdoor activities. And that, that, was, that was really lovely. I mean, vehicle-based projects are always a mega challenge because they need to be roadworthy. Um, and we, you know, as you've probably seen, we love complicated mechanics of things opening up in unexpected way uh, unexpected ways um but it was nice it was nice um the other thing about vivo is they they sort of embrace this sort of real futuristic technology with ecology and there's a sort of craft to their shoemaking but it's mixed with all these amazing sort of bio algaes and all this sort of biology and stuff and so we wanted the the vivo wagon to be a kind of combination of that so to use some really raw materials but then to be quite digital with, you know, all the LED lighting and um, solar panelled um, power and all of that sort of thing. Incredible. Um, I sometimes watch, you know, amazing spaces with the vehicles that you work on. And I do find it, it's incredible. It's kind of over my head, but I find it fascinating at the same time <laughs> how you do it all. So Slightly you, over our of, head. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. What sort of interior requests do you get from clients to work inside homes? Um all sorts it's normally where people want to do unusual things so there is a strand for our work which is you know working with people like Arnie Maynard and garden designers where where uh, we might creep into interiors and that's normally about just making really beautiful traditionally crafted furniture and then the the other side of our work is where somebody wants to do something unusual so they might want um you know, a living pod, uh, you know, a building within a building, or they might want some sort of furniture that, that needs to perform 
multi functions. So I think, I mean, in a way, the Amazing Spaces work is the best example of that, is, is trying to come up with experimental and fun ways of living, turning things slightly on their head. Um, and, and again, I mean, we, we, we love making furniture because it's something I did a lot at college. And, and I think because we work on a lot of big things, everybody in the team really loves it when we can just make something small and really purposeful and really get the detail um, just right. But um, we've, there's always been a kind of philosophy at Studio Hardy that we, we don't want to be instantly recognisable. We'd hope that we kind of bemuse anybody trying to track us. So, you know, just when you think you know what we do, we'll produce a piece of furniture that looks entirely different. But um, over the years, you know, you can see a kind of flavour, certain colours that come back and back, certain interesting experiments with geometry that just we can't lose we need to keep playing with i suppose that's the kind of artists in us that that have these themes that we just haven't quite exercised yet yeah is is there anyone or any particular kind of project on your list that you would love to do that you still haven't done yet oh that's a good question um wow i mean i think i think that the the honest answer is we thrive on the unknown. What What's so exciting about being a Studio Hardy is the phone rings and the first thing that the client says is, uh, I'm not quite sure how to explain this. <laughs> and we go, oh, perfect. This sounds right up our street. But it's the kind of, it's the not knowing. Literally, the phone rings and someone says, uh, we want to build a bridge, but it's not a bridge. It needs to float or something like that. And then you sort of uh, uh, dig deeper. Um, so it's it the, the thing that really excites me is the projects I can't possibly imagine what they are. But um, I suppose that you know there are some just quintessential carpentry things that you have to build. So you you, you kind of cathedral is probably a little bit ambitious, but um, uh, you know a bridge is a good example. There's such you know a bridge is such a beautiful expression of engineering and elegance and um sculpture and you know uh pragmatism it needs to be utterly practical um and i think i think that's probably a project that i'd really love to do maybe you'll do one on amazing spaces that would be good yeah i mean knowing amazing spaces you know george won't be satisfied with just a bridge it'll have to do something else like like go under you know fly or be a submarine or something (laughs) I love the eccentricity of all the people on the show, actually. Do you think we're probably, obviously you've travelled around meeting lots of different people and seeing different places. Are we high up on the um, building quirky things list? Oh, absolutely. I think there's this wonderful sort of British eccentricity that, um, you know, I think Shed of the Year just (laughs) exemplified that so incredibly that, you know, in, you know, our homes can quite often be quite conformist and you know there's sort of rules with homes um that people conform to but once you get into people's back gardens sort of you know the sky's the limit and um yeah i love it i love the characters that we meet and that it just proves that um you know people from all walks of life are great crafts people and great designers um yeah, just so many good examples of that. What was your first ever build on Amazing Spaces? Was it the um, caravan? That's right, yeah, George's caravan. So he um, he turned up having spent 350 quid, I think, on the most appalling static caravan I've ever seen. I, I never forget walking in there and just not knowing if I wanted to laugh or cry because it was kind of completely past its sell-by date and not brilliantly designed in the first place. And then George, of course, had all these, you know, incredible ideas he wanted to um, come up with. It had to do, you know, virtually everything, sleep five people and all, all, all of his, uh, you know, all these different things. But that was a great, uh, it was a great um, challenge because we di- really didn't like it. You know, sort of uh, being given something that you basically wanted to throw away and not not engage with at all. But then we had to you know, we had to engage and actually finding sort of making a relationship with the 70s, you know, it's a 70s static caravan. And we sort of made, you know, for the interior and the sort of interior design, that there is this sort of strange parallel between 70s and 50s. And 
that was a really good example of taking an era that I wasn't particularly interested in and then finding a language, a sort of, um, you know, sets of colours and forms and shapes and aesthetic that we, that we actually came to really love. I love the fact that the whole front opened up as well. So you had you could be in sit, almost sitting in a field. Yeah. No, I mean, if you wanted to find some sort of themes that run through Studio Hardy's work, one is playfulness, which the caravan had bags of it, you know, lots of tricks and sort of slightly fun and unexpected things. Um, and then the other thing that we do with every single one of our projects is, is try and blur the boundary between inside and outside. You know, living in Britain, you need to be outside as much as you possibly can, but you need to very quickly be able to close the door and sort of batten down the hatches. So if you look at any one of our projects, you realise that that they they try and open out to the outside, but they um, also need to create sort of cosy, safe, um spaces yeah i think your trip to finland was one of my favorite episodes um when you you um obviously uh, had a sauna and then you plunged into the lake <laughs> and you looked you it seemed euphoric afterwards and it did make me kind of think oh i want to try that it yeah i mean it was again it was like some sort of jewel just made me jump into lots of cold things so there was the finland's lake with you know a, a meter of frozen ice above that lake um and the other one was in the arctic circle i think i jumped in the sea above the arctic circle and you do you kind of get this there is definitely a before and after moment and i i, I think i think it is you know the Finns do that kind of daily and i think it's it's actually really really good for you that you kind of have this you know it is kind of evangelical experience of you're one person and you jump in some very very cold water and you go a little bit loopy for sort of half an hour and and then you feel a bit different <laughs> did you get to see the northern lights while you were there i never have george got to see them we, we've been chasing the northern lights in canada norway and finland and finally on i think on the last day of finland george was up up, up in the north and managed to see them but that's yeah, that's very much on the bucket list. I still haven't quite made it. Yeah, I want to do that too. And the amazing episode when you went under the glacier in Canada, that was just incredible. That that was mind-blowing. Um, just looking through ice that had potentially been there before humans. It was kind of really, you know, mind-blowing. And then we found a cave. So, I mean... That that whole trip was just incredible. You you arrive on a helicopter and sort of you know if you ever seen a helicopter land in the snow, it's pretty dramatic. And then you cl- you know clamber through meters of snow and find an entrance, and then go deep into the ice. And the the, the quality of light that that you know that the sun is making its way through you know up to you know I can't remember twenty or or, or thirty meters of ice, and the stillness there. And then the, the, the sort of the, to top it all off, we found because um, we were with a guide that you know has been up there regularly for years, and because the ice shifts, you know, it's it's moving, it's alive. The ice had shifted the, the, that winter or the summer, so that you, we could crawl through a gap and get into a cave with a lake that potentially, well, no, no human in living memory or recorded history had ever been in and just to be standing in a place that no human had stood in before um pretty good for a sort of you know playful architectural program <laughs> we did get treated yeah not bad at all and talking <laughs> of underground you also went to that sort of underground city with the olympic pool in was it helsinki yeah again i mean the, the, the these are i mean the educational journey for me of, of filming on amazing spaces is amazing so again i'm afraid i can't uh, you know remember all the facts but something like 200 kilometers of underground tunnels that can basically um house the entirety of helsinki so a, a city below a city um but yeah beautiful i love that swimming pool it was sort of again a sort of slightly 70s um slightly eastern block design but almost memphis design actually with sort of wonderful bright colors and um lots of angles that was a really cool space 
Well, it's incredible. Do you get to choose where you'll be going in the series or is it the production team that decide? There's a little bit of both. I mean, what's lovely is when we start a project, we, you know, that they, they you know, we worked together for so many years that um, they also know that George and I have a huge address books of, of places we want to go. And so quite often we'll suggest, um, and there might be a little bit of cheating there, like, you know, we're, we're kind of justifying it in terms of the program, but there's, you know, some iconic piece of architecture that we've always wanted to visit that we can kind of justify that it fits in with the narrative. So, um, I mean, that is a real treat, getting to, you know, meet some of your heroes and and not only just sort of incredibly talented people, but um, over the years we've got to see some incredible pieces of architecture that, that have been, you know, on our on our dream list. Yeah. What's the most ingenious build do you think could you possibly pick one out of all of them what that we've gone and visited yeah they visited yeah oh i'm drawing a blank there's sort of just this barrage of hundreds of things that we've seen i'm not surprised yeah <laughs> just just too many things <laughs> I'll, I'll kick myself after after this um interview i will be oh my gosh it all come flooding back <laughs> it will come to you yeah no doubt um so you've obviously built a whole load of things on the show um obviously like the observatory which was um not so long ago how long did that take to make it was slightly interrupted by um covid um, <laughs> but um the actual work i mean there's a lot of prep so i spend a lot of you know it, it almost impossible to quantify how much time but um a lot of design time which is often spent late at night puzzling and coming up with ideas and then you know running them past George um so that can take a few months but the the actual build of that was probably only about two months um and it was yeah like I said slightly interrupted by COVID but we um it's kind of that with amazing spaces we can be slightly playful and that we'll come up with a design but we'll also sort of solve problems on the hoof which is why some of those really wacky things come up why it doesn't always quite make sense and we do things in a slightly roundabout way but so we like to um sort of you know i'm thinking of the door of the observatory where we came up with one plan and then halfway through ended up talking to somebody about bikes and realizing that we could use bike parts so sort of changed the whole design and built it another way so um all in i think i think that was about about two months and that that's quite regular for amazing spaces it's sort of really was it the same for the rotating home as well probably yeah it's a kind of really high octane uh biggish team just throwing yourself at it a lot of um late nights and early starts just um and a sort of always a sort of looming deadline it's very inspiring the show because it's very easy for all of us just to sort of be on a journey and not sort of think about other possibilities but you watch it and it's so positive and inspiring do you get told that a lot we do I mean I I love the fact that it inspires children particularly and sort of you know teenagers because you know we live in a digital age and the worry is that you know craft and and design or, or making isn't really taught in schools at the moment um uh, there is obviously some provision, but the kind of education I got at school has really, really changed. And I love the fact that they get really, you know, they bully their parents to stay up late or later and watch Amazing Spaces. And then they bully their parents to say, come on, I want to do a project. So the amount of people, you know, that stop me in the street, and one person goes, we find it so inspiring. And the other person goes, you're to blame for my wife or my husband wanting to build a, you know, Death Star in our back garden <laughs> or whatever they're doing. So um, I'm really pleased that it's sort of championing um, people getting back into making and, and proving that you can just do it. You only need a small amount of space and potentially a small budget and you can, you, you know, you can build the unimaginable. It's probably been really good for people's minds as well in the last year or so, hasn't it? Given some people ideas for planning and, and doing things together as a family. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think one of the things like the rotating home is a good example. You know, I, I'm not sure I'd ever recommend to the world that we build thousands and thousands of rotating homes. But as a journey of thought and thinking in different ways and showing that, that 
you know, actually uh, what might seem initially whimsical or bonkers ideas actually have a logic. And, and when you explore them, they can, they can sort of make all sorts of new discoveries. And I, I think that that's one of the things that I really love about the show that we're, we're, we're showing people to think laterally and that there's not one way of doing things. There's not a right and wrong in design or, or making. There's hundreds of different ways of doing things. I love the, uh, the gimbal in the rotating home that you put all the mugs and cups on. Yeah. Uh, that, that tell you a very, well, I'll try and make a quick story is that came from, I was about nine years old and I was in, the south of France, and we were having a big lunch with a, a, a friend of a sculptor. And to entertain the kids after lunch, he got a cardboard box and he put a glass of wine, a full glass of wine, into the box. And then he handed it, he closed the box, cardboard box, and then he handed it round all the kids and said, throw it around, you know, rotate it, do whatever you want. We all played with it and handed it back to him. And he opened the box and pulled out a glass of wine that was still full and we were you know our jaws dropped our minds had been completely blown you know this sort of magic magic and then he opened the box and let let us look inside and there was a gimbal and I think that um yeah that was the inspiration I've always wanted to build one ever since that moment and sort of playing the same game with George of like here's a box here's a bit of magic so it's it's nice how um you know experiences from childhood kind of get it you know fed into uh into our daily work. Yeah, I was really proud of myself at that point because I knew what a gimbal was. <laughs> <laughs> Often I don't, but uh, I was like, oh no, because I, I have a camera, you know, a, a gimbal. Oh yeah, yeah. camera as well. So no, it's fa- I loved that episode. It was fantastic. So shed of the year as well. Is that going to be? coming back this year or? i i don't know i'm not sure when that will i mean there's a real sort of cult follower following of that uh project i think people really love it and um i know i know um channel four like it so we just have to wait and see i mean everything's a little bit chaotic at the moment so um i hope so it's such a it's such an inspiring and sort of feel good program um and so unexpected. I mean, I've got to say, for actual filming, all of all of the presenters just love it, and the camera crew. In fact, the whole crew love it because you turn up, we film in a day, sometimes two a day, and you just don't know what you're going to get. It's 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 a brilliant program. I, I've got my fingers crossed that it does come back this year because I love it. My whole family really enjoy it. Um, is it really hard to pick a winner because they're all so different, aren't they? Oh, it is absolute agony. I hate it. (laughs) I've done a few programmes where I've got to be a judge and it is just, it's so hard. Um, Luckily, we've got, um, you know, a a team of judges and we all quite like disagreeing, even deliberately. So that kind of makes it more complicated, but we always sort of, we, we end up finding a winner, but not everybody's happy. Has it inspired you ever at home? Have you got a, a crazy shed in your garden? I don't at the moment. I have lots of sort of half baked projects. Um, so I've I years ago bought an aluminium. Uh, it's part of a freight container for a for a railway carriage. So I've got that, and I've decked that out with um, some beautiful parquet floor that I was given for my 30th bag birthday for my 30th birthday a friend turned up with 40 bags of used parquet it's a great present um and then uh, <laughs> yeah so that that's a sort of mid-century modern um interior and I've got a 33 foot old mahogany hold pleasure cruiser river cruiser boat that is, um, I would say, treading water, and the kids really want me to crane that into the garden, and that. So, but basically, at the moment, I don't have a project in the garden, but we're having the, the uh, we're going to build some sort of play structure, and at the moment, we're in the sort of early feasibility design stage, and everybody's arguing about it. So, what, I, what I'm trying to uh, teach the kids is that let's come up with something that has to be beautiful, has to be really fun but is not too prescriptive because obviously the eight-year-old wants it to be all about dinosaurs and my uh, 10-year-old wants it to be about Star Wars and I quite want it to be some sort of 
crazy Baroque structure. So um, I'm not quite sure what's happening, but it's it's a work in progress. I, mean, I am quite tempted because they're, they're both quite in Star Wars at the moment to build a kind of timber frame at At Walker. Um, you know, one of those wonderful kind of brilliant structures that you get in Star Wars, but but make it in sort of you know really beautifully crafted timber. Oh, that's the, that would be the dream, wouldn't it? <laughs> what about inside? What about inside your house? So is is it very traditional, or does it have some of um, your designs and ideas around? There's a sort of bit of everything. I mean, there's that. There's an English version of this phrase, and I can't remember what it is, but the Spanish version translate as in the you know in the iron work in the metal workers house you eat with wooden spoons so the first thing i'd say is that almost every bit of furniture is broken <laughs> in some way and on the to-do list for the weekend um but no i i what well, m- my wife's a designer as well so it's kind of the only thing we argue about in the world <laughs> is sort of how the house should be so i i tend to look more at objects and live through individual pieces and then she tends to work more in atmosphere and what the sort of collection of of different things in a room um how they come to to an ambience but um we're sort of what is we're relatively uh new to the house so we're working through the the first one thing we've done is rather than having a sitting room we've created a huge studio. Um, so separate from the work studio, it's a kind of big creative space where we can make a mess and we can paint or do ceramics or um, draw or cut things or make things. And so I've designed a huge piece of furniture that that sort of has lots of little desks for anybody to work in. You have your own kind of like little cubicle desk and then a huge set of bookshelves and sort of lots of cupboards for printers and um, endless reams of paper. So, so um, the way we're designing the house is basically um, items of furniture, piece by piece, you know, living in the house for a while, getting a feel for what works. And then I, I really love uh, antiques and sort of really varied, um, you know, our kitchen has a walnut kind of slightly baroque sideboard with a you know 1950s milan coffee machine on it and then next to it is a piece of a couple of pieces of 50s furniture and the you know around the kitchen table is some you know 19th century classic welsh um stick chairs so it's a kind of um pretty eclectic but there's there's some sort of plan there <laughs> I like the word eclectic. I'd say our house is a bit like that too. So what are your plans for this year in the studio? Have you got anything exciting coming up in the next few months? Yeah, we've got a lot of projects. Um, I mean, the mo- uh, as I've said before, the most exciting ones are the unknown. There's a couple that uh, I can't really talk about at this stage, unfortunately, but a couple of really tantalising, interesting, you know, impossible combinations of collaborations that are, uh, are um limbering up and then we've got a lot of heritage playground projects we, we've got a project up in Belsay in Northumberland which is the most amazing um garden with a big house and a ruined castle and there um the theme of, 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 on the sort of emblem and for the family the Middleton family that lived up there is the wild man of the woods so we developed a um a playground based on sort of the wild man's wild man of the woods uh sort of world so the kids will step into this woodland and into a sort of magical picturesque um version of of the of the savage in the woods uh, and what one of the parts is a sort of seven or eight meter tall pods that you'll climb up all this netting to get up to these lookout pods that are kind of look a bit like kind of um, nutshells that that sit really high up in the canopies of the trees so that's really exciting and then we're doing a playground right now in the in the cannons in Mitcham in in south london which is a playground that's essentially designed in collaboration with the children of the area so that's really exciting we've taken you know that this big piece of scrumple paper sculptural climbing frame 
and then all the towers um we've kind of literally taken have how the children have drawn things so all the towers are slightly wobbly and wonky um which is a real challenge to make in timber but but will look look really spectacular oh, it's so nice to hear that the kids are involved in that as well will you be on your instagram when you've done it so yeah absolutely i mean i've got to say the kids were just brilliant the way that they um engage with the design process and uh how how laterally they can think but also how pragmatic i mean they're really really budding designers um and I, and it would be re- uh, you know i I mean, just what a sense of pride of actually having designed something that is for your community and that you can play in and generations can play in. It's very cool. Absolutely. And from such a young age. Well, thank you so much for chatting to me today. I've really enjoyed it. And um, I'm looking forward to seeing what you come up with. Thanks very much. Really nice to chat. If you'd like to visit William's website, it can be found at studiohardy.com. And they have an Instagram at studiohardy. There are some brilliant shots of the observatory on there and loads of cool projects. My website with my interior design services and inspiration is lucylovesyou.com and my Instagram is lucygleasoninteriors. Do come over and say hi. Don't forget to subscribe for more episodes. I feel super lucky to have more great guests coming up. And do also rate this podcast too if you're enjoying my chats. Until next week, have a good one. Bye.